Oh, okay, okay. Do we, how do we want to do you guys? Do we want to use the center mic or what do we hand the beer to the guy? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Sean, your voice is creating environment. Good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Where would you put the sediment from Montecito instead of in the Oh, see, I knew someone asked me that. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. The answer is I don't know. Um, so, so, yes, Ventura Fairgrounds is getting a lot of stuff. I, I mean, again, this is one of those ones where when the 101 is, we can't travel the 101. <laughs> Um, important economic uh, lifeline. We need to get that open. They have to move it somewhere. Um, I would say that uh, <laughs> uh, I would just say that there are places that are desperate for sediment. There's places that are desperate for sediment, like Broad Beach yes. in Malibu, right? That um, again, don't want to get too political here, but um, but they really want sediment. Oh my God, there's a lot of sediment that we have. Um, I suspect, it, it, it's, it's generally speaking, it's not sewagey or whatever. It smells a little anoxic because it's it's mostly been under underwater. I have a strange suspicion that those folks might not want it because it maybe stinks a little bit. But hey, it's sediment, right? So that would be one possibility. But it's not. It, th that's a little snarky of me to take that truck and drive those diesel powered, basically pretty dirty trucks all the way down to Malibu is gonna have a ton of emissions associated with it. Compared to, you know, relatively close by, definitely close by, so, so there's no easy answer here. I, I would say though that um, uh, I wonder if if the situation was reversed, if, if Carpinteria had a bunch of sediment it had to get rid of, if Montecito would take their sediment. <laughs> I'm not sure if that would happen. Yeah. That's my non-answer. Is there any rethinking about not doing fire suppression and doing controlled burns? Is that bringing oh, that up now? I would love to do that. I would love to do that. In our bureaucratic state, I don't see that, at least, at least right now, I don't see that as happening. So when I went up to Stanford and started working on doing controlled burns, I went to 19 control burns that were all called off that day or the day before until I got to my first control burn. They were all called off last minute because people said, oh, air quality, air quality, you know, people have asthma and all this stuff, which is a real concern. But apparently they're not that concerned when we actually have a, a rampant wildfire that totally nukes the air for three, you know, several weeks. So, so, it, so it, it's, a, it's, a non, it's a real concern, but we just are not there's two things going on there. One is the air quality that we're worried about in terms of control. So, so the time that people want to do the burns are when the fires are least likely to get out of control. And so that basically means fall. So the highest humidity. But the fires actually burn differently then than they do, for example, during the summer. So they're not necessarily as effective. What we need to do is we need to get to the mode where we treat fire as farming. We do fire farming, not controlled burn. So it's, it's a routine part of this. That's what the Chumash did. So the Chumash said in many American, uh, Native American tribes across California, look dude, we can walk around for eight hours gathering acorns, which sucks, or we could burn the heck out of the place and take care of a lot of the underbrush and little babies and then have a couple big oak trees, which are so big they don't get, they don't get killed by the fire, that have all these fat acorns and we can spend two hours getting acorns. Let's do that. So they did a lot of burning. Uh, the valley floor of Yosemite looks the way it looks because we actively burn, the native, native peoples actively burn the valley. Um, so, so this has been a traditional way to manipulate and interact with the environment. The challenge is we've built up so much fuel to get to that area where we do a burn and it's a little small fire it is, is a challenge. Um, it, it, so, so first is the air quality. This, the second thing is risk management, quite honestly. So um, we've had a couple of these control burns that did escape control and cause problems. And those have given a black eye to, the, to this technique. So it's both being able to really handle risk and, and being able to, to deal with risk as adults. I mean, the classic example is my institution, uh, California State University is massively risk averse. So whenever we go to fly drones, oh my god, you're flying drones. 
scuba diving. Oh my god, scuba diving. Uh, tagging bears. Oh my god, it's so dangerous. They have no problem with my undergrads getting in a car and driving on the 101, a million times more dangerous than anything we would do. So this notion of having true perceptions of risk and, and, and really coming to terms with it is a non-trivial thing. Um, one of the most interesting things that's happened, and maybe some of you have experienced this, people are having a hard time renewing their insurance in the wake of Thomas. So this has happened in Northern California, and, and there's a lot of suspicion this will start happening to us. So the notion is we have this policy, we have a fire policy, et cetera, all things are good. And then again, because of climate change and the changed setting in which we find ourselves, now some of the insurance agencies are like, uh, yeah, no, we're not gonna insure those properties at that, at that rate in this location. And so they've just opted to not allow you to, or some people uh, to renew their, their policies. So that's, that's a real thing, right? And so, um, and so that's part of this thing of can we start to use controlled burns to manage the risk? And I think if more people start finding, uh, or are finding it more difficult to get insurance policies, that might help make people a little more willing to accept a bit of risk from doing controlled burns. But, but right now, controlled burns are, 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 I would say in most instances, are not a practical tool because of the, the hurdles being so high to, to enact the burn. You would have to go to the Air Pollution Control District of Ventura County That's right. or Santa Barbara County and get That's right. permission. And That's they right. have strict parameters That's about right. when, when you can do the conditions, etc. That's right. Absolutely. Can I, let me interject real quick. Is, so long as Sean is willing to answer questions, grab a beer and enjoy this. There's beer to be had. Yes, a beer! And, uh, we're, we're happy to stick around for a little bit. I'll try to get to everybody's questions and bear with us. Thanks, Sean. This is a math question, maybe I just didn't understand, but I, I thought at first that you said that the catastrophic rain event level was, you know, with uh, much higher uh, risk of mudslides and such was was um, 24 millimeters in 15 minutes. Yep. And then later there was a slide that said 15 minutes at the rate of 24 millimeters an hour, which would only be a quarter of an inch, which is you know, uh, 15 minutes. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's. I think it's. I, I, think, I think it's 24 millimeters in 15 minutes. I think. I think. I'm double checking. I think that's. I think that's the correct. Yeah. I think that's correct. I probably missed the yeah. 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 So, so they, they had. So the, I just said the fire station in Montecito. Sorry, had six tenths of an inch in 12 minutes. Yeah. So that was. It was just. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So given the huge amount of land that burned, how would you expect migration patterns to change? Uh, Great question. So what's, what's, so I didn't, I didn't show our roadkill data yet because it's still, still coming in and stuff, but, but the short version is in the immediate wake of the fire, critters are much more mobile. They, they, they run to, to go away. Even the small ones try to, try to run. Um, they either run and die or run and burn up or whatever, or run and find uh, safe haven. Once they find safe haven, the pattern seems to be they they are freaked out and they hang out for a few days or, or several days and they're just disoriented. Then they either get hungry enough or whatever and they start to move. The large bodied critters move a lot. So um, initially what's going to happen are the scavengers, coyotes, uh, crows, uh, vultures, they go and they start munching all of the carcasses. So all the all the, the bunny bunny chips basically that are around. And so they start eating that and they're and they're stuff. Um, uh, and then once they and then uh, then the next thing that seems to happen is the large bodied critters uh, start to cast farther and farther uh, uh, go farther and farther away. And is there so they don't need habitat as much. So the coyotes don't necessarily need, I mean, they would like to go from patch to patch to patch, but they don't have to. So what we think uh, happens, and again, uh, the, the perfect place to test this is, is the CESPI, but because of the road being closed, we haven't been able to get up there in the flight restriction. But what we think happens is the erosion is, is um, much greater than uh, what some of the engineers would predict. So the engineers do their, their, do their calculations of erosion based on here's the slope, and here's this much rain, and it'll make it go down. So we think that, and we saw this qualitatively with the Springs fire, 
So as these large bodied critters move around a lot, deer, so the classic example is here's a, here's a vegetated slope, here's a trail, the deer is walking on the trail, and, and it's just the regular thing. Then we have the fire come through, now it's all, it's all denuded. So now, now the deer walk on this just like walking over a snow field and acts as a nucleating source and starts all these little micro avalanches. So we think that the, that the movement that starts, call it a week or, or two after, after the fire, after the fire goes through an area, that they might either be causing a lot of erosion or, or priming more erosion to happen when that first big, big rain uh, event happens. That's the large body critters. The small body critters, um, maybe, small body critters seem to stay really, really close. Initially, they're like, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell? And the, and the larger guys are eating the carcasses. Once they deplete those carcass resources, they, they're like, ah, oh, damn, there's a bunch of little dudes in this shrub. So they kind of hang out. I'm like, yeah, come on out, little, little guy. And so, so there's a sec, probably a secondary high mortality source on the small guys as those predators, bobcats and coyotes, start to try to attack them. Um, and then their numbers are just gonna, gonna continue to go down. So we think there's an initial die-off in the small body uh, uh, critters as they, as they run or they just get baked or whatever. But then um, they have a real hard time. They, so typically what we have, if you look at the landscape, is we have uh, maybe a little bit of remnant vegetation or, 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 or burnt but not totally dead vegetation in the draw. And then you go up and there's a ridge and you go down and there's vegetation over here. So the deer can go between, the coyote can go between, the voles and stuff cannot. So they pretty much are restricted to their little area. So if their little area happens to have water, happens to have whatever, will be okay. If not, they, they either starve or they get attacked as they start to move farther and farther away. I think. Oh my god, free advertising. I'm going to put this on my bald head. Um, so we're looking at controlled burns as a way of removing carbon from above the surface of the ground. What are your thoughts on putting carbon back into the ground using carbon sequestration by accelerating decomposition, focusing our energy on? Yeah, I, I think I think um, that's it, it's that's what we, we should. So so the the COP twenty three that are uh, the the big discussion in Germany in November. We have two sort of different historically had two sort of fairly separated uh, groups in terms of how we deal with climate change. So one has been sort of a, a you know, hard engineering, you know, build big machine to suck the stuff out of the atmosphere type of approach. The other approach is to do stuff like planting plants and trying to sequester things with, with natural activities. Um, the neat thing that happened in, in, um, in Germany was that these folks really seem to start be coming together, saying we should, we should consider all these options because things are getting dire enough. But I think the notion of sequestering stuff with, with roots, rhizomes, grass, that's, I think, super awesome and, and a totally um, viable thing. Oh, what a good friend. Look at this. People are bringing beer. It's good. It's good. Uh, so the answer is I think that'd be great. Um, I, think, I think historically people have had perhaps an incorrect an incorrect understanding of sub uh, of below ground biomass sequestration. So a lot of times people said forest, 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 but really a lot of these more herbaceous communities like grasslands and stuff actually can for their for unit area can actually sequester a huge amount of uh, biomass in the form of roots and stuff. So I think that's I think that's great. Um, wetlands can also sequester um, a good amount. So I think I think um, you know farming carbon is a great is a totally cool thing. I think it's a great idea. Okay, um, this is fantastic, and you're very, very interesting. <laughs> I fooled you so well! But I wish that this room were the size of Ventura so everybody could hear you. Is there a place online that has some of your information that we can share with our friends that we think would be fascinated also? Uh, good question. Uh, we have some websites, but we don't have anything yet directed just to fire. We might be putting something together in the future. Ventura Land Trust wants to build some more resources. We've recorded this, so this is this will be this will be available. But um, I guess I would say that um, there is a lot of stuff online. I'm not sure, and I'm not trying to knock my colleagues or whatever, but. 
But a lot of the stuff online comes from people that did studies 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I think folks have not come to terms with the changed world that we're in. The one thing I didn't talk about is after the 2013 uh, fire, one of the things that my lab is working on is recover of an, recovery of an endangered Dudley, so a succulent plant. So on the western, oh yeah, they get whistling for Dudley. That's <laughs> Dudley is so hot. That's, you know. so, the, so the western end of the Santa Monica is Dudley of Viridii. Um, we had about about 20,000 individuals of this little plant that's, you know, yay big, slow growing. Springs Fire came in and burned 100% of the global distribution of this plant. We dropped down to something on the order of a few hundred individuals. Because they reproduce asexually, we probably had on the order of a dozen or, or so 50 at the most probably gen unique genetic uh, uh, clones of these guys. So we went from thousands to handfuls. So we've been trying to figure out if we can help restore these guys but the drought has massively, massively complicated that. So when we look when we, we look at the literature, we live in an area that fire is natural, right? Chaparral, coastal sage scrub, all this stuff is, some of our seeds, if they're not baked, they will not crack open and they, they will not germinate. Some of our seeds need to be smoked. They need to be exposed to the smoke from, from chaparral and, and our, our, our leaves for them to, to change the chemistry of the outer shell to allow water to come in and germinate. So that's, that's all real. Um, but um, that sometimes leads people to say, oh, the fire came through and burned it. We're a, we're a Mediterranean ecosystem, so it's just it's all natural. No. And Dudley is the example that we can't just take what people have said for the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years for granted, because these guys are not recovering. So it's not just that we have changed fire conditions, we have changed um, precipitation conditions, and that's the thing that, that we, a lot of where you look around, people people are using examples from 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and, and not that, those, that they were wrong about that, but but it's unclear if that's really a good fit for us going in the future. So, um, yeah, so it's a great task for some of my students to put together some of our observations, but but right now, I'm not sure, but Land Trust is probably a great uh, website, is probably a great place. Speaking of the Ventura Land Trust website, CAPS TV is filming this tonight, so if you'd like to go back and reference something that Sean has said, or if you'd like to share this with other people, it will be on our website, so please check on that. And uh, before any of you filter out, um, please consider being a member of the Land Trust if you aren't already. We really appreciate when you are so that we can provide this and get out ahead of these important ecological situations. I'm going to continue with questions. Thanks so much, Sean. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, a picture was sent to me by family in the fire in Big Sur a year ago. Mm -hmm. This was just a few days after the fire. A picture of a spider in its web. And it's like, how could that possibly be? The, the temperature of the fire penetrates the earth. How many inches down below? I mean, I, 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 it how could that spider live Right, through it that? depends. So we can have, so we've had, I've had temperature probes underneath uh, the, you know, burying the ground, um, a, a, a couple inches, a couple inches, that only got, you know, slightly warm. We've also had some conditions more like what we have the Thomas fire, you know, and a, a couple inches down, getting to be 1,200 degrees. So it really is, so it, it, these fires are, can, be, can be very, very patchy. And so they might go down this, down this hillside and, and it might burn everybody up here, but there might be a little nook, a little, a little rock, a little, a little whatever the heck, and there, there's a little refugia. And that seems to be where a lot of the seeds and guys persist. But, but, but to answer your question specifically about spiders, they probably floated in. So well, spiders that. throw yeah. up these parachutes, yes. yep. and then they kind of like, whoa, and they sort of extreme float in. Sure. So the classic example of that, I remember as a kid, was uh, Mount St. Helens. So Mount St. Helens, just boom, everything is nuked, just like, you know, nuclear bomb goes off. And one of the first, and within, um, was it six days or whatever, this, this guy was walking through, spider webs everywhere. Oh, wow. And so they, they, they alighted on this area, but they, they probably didn't do too well. There probably wasn't, weren't many flies, but, but, but they, they get in there really, really quickly. So spiders are awesome. Uh, 
uh, slight follow-up to that. I'm interested in burrowing animals. Uh, if it doesn't, if burrows don't get hot enough, would they uh, die from smoke inhalation? So would yeah, they the have an instinct yeah. where they build the burrows so that yeah. it takes care of it. So the question is about is about small mammals burrowing mammals. Uh, the classically frail animal, and, and my wife helps helps uh, helps run the bunny brigade at, at the animal what? shelter. So yeah, there you go. What 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 <laughs> rabbit what? Um, so so rabbits, and this will make my wife cry. So I'm glad she's not here. So rabbits are really really not good at dealing with fire. So rabbits have an incredibly low tolerance to heat. So for example, that, that one picture I showed. If you guys, if you guys uh, saw it, the, the bunny wasn't really burnt. Uh, oh, well, the one was totally burnt. But the one from 2013, um, a lot of the stuff that we found dead, we're walking around a completely black, charred landscape, and there's a perfectly good bunny. He's dead. A perfectly good bunny, not charred or whatever. So clearly, it was thermal stress, or in the case of rabbits, they're 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 they're, they're jittery creatures, and so sometimes you gotta go, and they die. So, so it, it's both the stress of stuff, thermal stuff, and then, and then thirdly, yeah, you're exactly right, it's a smoke inhalation. Yeah. And so, a lot of times the burrows themselves are deep enough that they don't, they don't you know, get carbonized, they don't, they don't burn, but they still get those gases. And so if it's a light grass fire that's kind of whoosh, they generally are okay. But if it's one of these you know, sideways blasting furnaces, that persists for 10, 15, 20 minutes, two hours, they pretty much can't take those. So the small animals in particular are new. Yeah. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I have a question. We have a, what's always been called a Mediterranean climate, and you mentioned it in response to a question, a couple of questions ago. And um, what I'm wondering is how much, um, the, how much the, the climate change is going to perhaps move us to more of a desert than a Mediterranean climate. And what we need to do to plan for um, fire safety in the future as we, if we're going to move more towards desert, uh, um, how that could affect us. We're, so this is not an exact science by any means, but we're probably not going to go to a desert, but we're probably going to be more like San Diego. So, so we're not going to sort of become the Mojave, or we're probably going to become like something a couple hundred miles uh, to the south of us. And so that's an excellent question. Um, so the so that's, that's sort of what's on, on the table for us. So I, I sit on a state panel uh, from a thing called the Ocean Protection Council where we're, we're creating some new, new guidelines for what's called once through cooling. So once through cooling is what we do for our our old legacy power plants here in Ventura we, and other places around the state, we suck water up one pass through to cool the power plant and then and then chuck it back out to the sea. And those tend to be really uh, harmful to fish larvae and things like that. So one of the things that's clearly coming on, whether people say this or not, it is absolutely what's gonna happen, more, desal more desalination as a source of water. And so, and so as we talk about water supply, that, that's, that's just, it's going to happen. I mean, I, I, I don't see how we, at least in coastal California, especially Santa Barbara, which is, which, which ha I mean, they're, they're actively, re they're starting their plan. But, but Camarillo, uh, possibly some stuff here in Ventura. Um, and so one, we have to talk about some additional supplies of, of water. But two, um, uh, there's, we're, we're relatively good here in Ventura. Um, I just was down in Orange County. Um, I'll just say that there's a lot of green stuff in Orange County. <laughs> there's a lot of green lawns and very lush. I'm like, what? They're a couple hundred miles south of us. So uh, with water, Da Vinci said, with water and time, all things are possible. So, so with a little more water, we can do whatever. The question is, how do we responsibly do that? How do we do it to minimize our impact from the energy consumption, et cetera? And, um, and the reality is we still have, uh, as, as relatively good as we are, we still have a lot of opportunity to do, to do stuff. Our, our Ventura wastewater facility discharges waste into the estuary. So we're essentially throwing water back into the estuary. 
Um, so there, there are there are definite um, uh, um, larger scale efficiencies we can recover. Uh, my my backyard, I let die. So it was, we, 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 I don't like lawn, but we had we had lawn back. My son was little, and all the neighborhood kids would come play. And then when the drought happened, I was like, "Oh, I have let the lawn die. Sorry." You know. And so then it died, and then I didn't really do anything. So I'm lazy. And so so my, my lawn is dead. So we're in the process of, of of landscaping our backyard, putting in the bocce ball court, putting in some impervious surfaces, putting in some bio swales and stuff. So without necessarily spending a lot of money, there's there's some really great things you can do. One great example. Um, at the National Park Visitor Center, some of my students just recently, and, and maybe some of you guys, Ventura Master Gardeners, have put in a new um, a, a new uh, garden, native plant garden, and it's really cool because the original garden out in front of the National Park Service was, we're about the islands, we're gonna plant a bunch of island plants, and I like island plants, but that's beyond most of your ability, right? That's like some, some super botany nerd that's gonna spend 17 years growing some plant and planting it. What they use in that in that garden, that Xeriscape garden, is are all plants that are easily accessible by you guys. So they're in native plant uh, facilities. They're they're a green thumb. You do not have to spend a million dollars. They're not some hyper weird breed. And so they designed that garden to be a great model for anybody in this room that wanted to redo some of their own landscaping that was water smart, native friendly. You know, had, had, had flowers all year long for aesthetics and for insects and things like that, but it wasn't some hyper, you know, incredible bar that no one could attain. So there's, there's more and more examples like that is what, what I would say. Hi, the uh, Ventura Food Co-op is hosting a discussion, a series of discussions on how to rebuild Ventura regeneratively. So our next, uh, our uh, first uh, talk in the series is uh, on revegetating Ventura at uh, the Ventura Library, two o'clock on Saturday at the uh, Women's March, so you can come on over. And um, uh, continue on in water. Uh, there's the old where, par old water paradigm of uh, getting rid of the, the uh, rainwater, the stormwater surge. And um, so there's a new water paradigm that's advocated by uh, Michael Krasik. A Slovakian water uh, expert, and um, he talks about you know uh, uh, making use of the water you know wherever it falls as much as you can you know before it runs off to the ocean to slow it, spread it, sink it, basic permaculture idea, and so uh, he has this idea that if everybody every place uh, just captured the rainwater where it fell using micro dams and swales and and curb cuts and, and the whole you know, thousands of, of little measures that we could store enough water that we could revegetate, we rehydrate the landscape. And uh, like you, you're... Uh, yeah, so, take so on that. I, don't, I don't know the numbers. I don't know if we could rehydrate the whole landscape, but it certainly could be better. So for example, um, one of the policy things that has happened statewide has been this concern. So we, we've Clean Water Act, um, when we had uh, when we had a relatively functioning federal government that passed the Clean Water Act and things of that nature, um, the idea was, hey, let's go after the low hanging fruit. Let's go after these these uh, you know point source pollution folks. We've mostly done a good job of cleaning that up. So now the emphasis is migrated onto so called non point uh, source. Discharge so so stuff that's coming over the landscape and one of the big responses to this so there was storm water So one of the big things Ventura is dealing with County of Ventura You know Camarillo Oxnard everybody is, is how do we deal with storm water? One of the approaches has been to do these so-called bio swales or, or similar things where we capture the water and either hold it temporarily or actually allow it to percolate into the water rather than running over the roads and over the this and over the that and then going into the storm drain and then going to the rivers and stuff. And um, in talking with some engineers from Thousand Oaks that have done, that really taken this to heart and like new developments all have to have these bioswales and everything. They, they, at least half jokingly, it's unclear if it's really gonna happen, but because we're entering this era of crazy ass rain and no rain, you know, the extremes, we're going to this, these swings in the extremes. One thing they wonder is, 
maybe we might be too good at intercepting the surface water and just start capturing everything and recharging it. And, and, and essentially, that at least in Thousand Oaks, they're putting in so many bioswales that they, under, under quote unquote normal rain conditions, there might be not much surface flow at all flowing across the surface and down into the river. Whether that's a bad thing or not, we can talk about it. But, but some jurisdictions are getting to the point where they actually have, some jurisdictions are getting to the point where they have so many bioswales that um, that's at least theoretically a possibility. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Uh, Tom Hicks. Uh, I've been working with Derek. How many of the people in this room are members of the formerly known as the Ventura Hillsides Conservancy, now the Ventura Land Trust? You know, I'm a water attorney, and I just want to give Derek in particular and your leadership a big shout out for some what might be called vision. Uh, I'm part of a, 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 a project team that was awarded funds from the state's wildlife conservation board related to integrated water strategies that involves the Ventura River watershed. And maybe in follow up to some of these last questions, I would only ask and suggest that the, the idea that uh, between burned landscapes and, and flooded landscapes we're you know, in rainfall and other considerations. We are in a new time and a new era. And the land trust is on the very forefront of being part of project teams that explore how we can engage in voluntary transactions and projects that create benefits for our watershed. All within the same model as land trusts are familiar conservation easements and such. But when you look at water as its own particular natural resource asset, I know asset isn't always a word that people think of, but I just say it gently, that uh, you guys are at the forefront and this conversation is really, thank you. We're all integrated in a multidisciplinary team. Thank you, Tom. Let me say real quick before we get the next question. It's very, it's, it's hard sometimes to get proper perspective. I can't tell you how many people call me up from Florida, from other places. What's up with this SOAR thing? What's up with this wildlife habitat connectivity stuff? We sometimes are in the midst of it here and we forget how innovative some of our, our goings on here actually, actually are compared to a lot of our colleagues around the country. So, so you guys should be very proud of what you guys are doing. Hi, so I was just asked to also introduce myself. My name is Laura Meeker and I work with the Ventura County Watership Protection District. It's a water resources specialist. I work on stormwater and I'm also the coordinator for the Santa Clara River Watershed Committee. It's a group of stakeholders um, that meets regularly to talk about water issues in Ventura County. Um, we actually coordinate also with the upper Santa Clara River watershed in LA County. Um, we have a meeting next Thursday. If you're interested in ever joining our, our uh, list, you can contact me, come find me. But I, I wanted to point out something that we talked about is um, uh, in terms of native plants and regrowth and landscaping choices, um, something to keep in mind is what I've learned from um, other experts is that some native plants and drought tolerant plants can tend to be a little more fire prone than others um, because they have low water content. That's not to say though that there aren't excellent native plants for um, planting in fire prone areas. And there's a great resource for all of you to find. It's um, on UC Extension's website. I think it's, if you just look up wild or fire safe landscapes, it was actually developed here for Ventura County in Southern California. And there's a great list of plants that you can plant, plant around your homes that are native and fire safe. So I just want to encourage you that not all native plants are created equal in terms of fire safety. So, but there are good resources. So be careful and, and um, specific when you actually are looking to replant for that purpose. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Sean. Hey. Um, 
I'm Marty Witter, I'm the fire ecologist for the National Park Service, and I have to say, that was an amazing presentation, Sean. The oh, amount of information you pulled together was an incredible tour of force. Oh, so, but I do have a but statement. Yeah, I know that the bad part is always comes yeah, out that's of the good. That's good. <laughs> So, uh, my one concern is that I've heard a number of people talk about um, if we just did prescribed burning, that would be the way to manage uh, these kinds of fires. But uh, in Southern California, fire is probably the greatest threat to our native plant communities. So this is the Ventura Land Trust, and I assume that um, these landscapes are precious to you. Chaparral, coastal sage, oak woodlands, grasslands. So um, uh, Sean did show you the map, uh, the fire map of the Santa Monica Mountains that shows the incredible amount of fire that we have on the landscape. So. The fire regime is driven by all these anthropogenic fires. We get way, way, way too much fire. Um, as everyone in Ventura knows, um, nothing stopped that fire under those conditions. And all of these fires that um, burn the most acreage, that cause the, uh, the large structure losses, are all um, occur under uh, extreme fire conditions. And uh, prescribed burning, previous wildfires, do not stop fires under those conditions. So um, we need to be looking at ways to reduce the frequency of fires in these mountains. Um, we need to look at uh, protecting our communities within defensible space. And so those are my suggestions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and no, I'll send you some maps, Sean. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, Thank you. Thank so, you for that. so the Sierra is one of the complicating factors is bark beetle and, and, and dead dead uh, dead trees that are creating greater fire risk. Um, and that's a, that's a real concern. We have a lot of stressed trees because of the drought that also have made things more problematic. And I think part of the concern is, is uh, at least as I have seen it, is one of the responses to try to try to manage catastrophic fires, hey, maybe we should be doing some logging or some some you know biomass removal um, to 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 take down that and and because maybe some of the folks that are proposing that are not always the strongest environmental advocates. I think sometimes that that notion has gotten caught up in a dirty word or that we can't possibly do that kind of of biomass clearing or or, or, or non fire related management of the, the fire risk. And I would suggest that um, with all these things, we need to look at this up with wide eye, you know, open eyes and not come in with, with prejudice that this is the only thing we should do or this thing is evil. And really in this globally weirded world that we're inheriting, we need to consider all options, which maybe some folks would have not considered before. I think it's really important that we look at what are the upsides of all these options, what are the downsides of all these options. So yeah, totally. We gotta be out of here at nine, and I'm so uh -oh. sorry I can't get everybody. Um, but maybe a little bit after nine, if you have a direct question for Sean. But take it away. We'll get a few All more right. in. I'll try to be quick. But my name is Laura Marr, and I represent many organizations in our watershed. <laughs> and one of the things I love about you, Sean, is I was I was told by Cause Hannah to reach out to you years ago because I'm all over the place like you are. And I love connecting the dots. And you know, your comment about desal hits home to me in Camarillo, knowing that we are in a medium priority basin right adjacent to one of three high priority groundwater basins and understanding this awareness of our groundwater and the need to do on-site water reuse. And the fact that our county is one of the farthest behind in the entire state with gray water and understanding how to use this rainwater in our landscapes without irrigation. So that's one of my things. I do want to plug one out of every 10 homes. If we can just get gray water out of your laundry machine to your landscape, we don't need desal plants. So reducing that energy use from solar to water to everything we do. I think that's one of the things we need to plug. I also would like to advocate for repatriating the beaver for the small <laughs> solutions. Yay, we can only do so much. Yay, beaver! All right, Laura, that was pretty.
pretty cool, thank you. <laughs> Sean, my name is Michael Whitman. My company is Blue Sky Biochar, we have met in the past. And I just wanted to share with you, um, you mentioned Thousand Oaks, California and their practices. Well, about five, six years ago, Thousand Oaks was the first city in the nation to officially adopt biochar for all new tree plantings. We've planted probably 4,000 trees through the drought, not one tree died because the biochar created this wonderful reservoir for holding moisture, nutrients, and microbiology. And it is what the fires normally do, leaving the char and ash behind, slowly regenerates into the soil and gets to the root zone and manages the soil's water, nutrients, and microbiology. But the fires are so hot, it's creating more ash and less char. Also, we're having fires within our residential areas and they're creating all this pollution from all the plastics and other synthetic materials we make our homes from. So in a natural wild area, the char and ash would be very beneficial, but it causes more problems when buildings are burning. And so what I do in my work is where I, I study biomimicry and I study fire. And if we, of course we don't want our homes and businesses to burn down, but if we mimic what fire does to the land by creating this biochar charcoal for soil in a clean way, then we can restore it into the soil without necessarily having to have the fire come through for that effect. By all the way, you mentioned something about smoke. Smoke is as good as the fire because it covers everything. And the smoke from a fire will condense into something called wood vinegar, which protects the plants and trees from disease and pests and seriously advances the photosynthesis when they start growing again. Hmm. So wood vinegar is something wood vinegar. really hot. That's a good one. I don't know about wood vinegar. Well, I'm about. going to follow up with you okay, on good. it and get you some good. so you can play with it. I want to just thank you. It was an awesome you know, oh, thank you. experience tonight. And you validated everything I do when I do my lectures and my classes and my talking. I, I felt very comfortable tonight how you validated me. So oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Ditto to all that about your speech. So do you as scientists figure that we should expect more Thomas fires? Yes. Yes. In this area? Uh, not so much our area, because if you, if you, if you, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that map where it had like, you know, Zaka and all this and that, we, we just, this was one of the big areas that had not burned. Like, for example, I mentioned the area behind uh, behind the city hall that hadn't burned in at least a hundred years, maybe a hundred and fifty odd years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, uh, uh, forward. Or, or backwards, backwards, sorry, backwards, backwards. 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 This is a different lecture. Backwards. Oh, I don't know what happened. Okay, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Uh... Question, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we know if we're in a floodplain? Uh, where do you live? Up by Wells Road. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so everybody's in a watershed. Whether you're in a floodplain or not will depend on how how low you are. But, but. Um, but so the notion of a watershed and, and that was really, th this notion was really put forward in the 1970s that, that how do we orient ourselves to the natural landscape? There's all kinds of ways. Some people look at, look at uh, aesthetics, some people look at, at mountains and whatever, but, but the notion of a watershed is a way to think about your, uh, your impact and your, and your presence. So everybody lives in a watershed. Um, floodplain, there's a couple different definitions. The floodplain is basically during the highest high top, the highest high rain event. Um, how high would the water get? So that would be the definition of a floodplain, per se. Um, and as long as you guys are out of that, I think that one thing I one exercise I do with my students when I take them to this uh, the technical term is a F up development in Westlake Village. But um, when I take them there, there's 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 sort of a hillside and there's there's some super giant big mansions and stuff, and, and their vineyards and stuff like that. And then you come down, and there's a house, and there's a, there's a, there's a riparian quarter. There's a riparian quarter, there's a, riparian quarter there's a house below that. 
And so I make all my students promise me that they'll never buy a house at the very, not that they'll ever be able to afford a house, but you know, if they do, they'll never buy a house at the, at the tail end of where that, that disaster could take them out. And so, so floodplain, it's important to know where we are, but, but really important is to know what our risk is and to know what our potential vulnerability is. And um, this, again, requires many fears, but, but um, our society doesn't deal properly with floodplain risk. After Katrina, there was a movement for the National Flood Insurance Program to try to properly to give the proper economic signals to people that were in places that were particularly vulnerable, um, which would essentially amount to them having to pay more money for, for flood insurance. Uh, that has been torpedoed. That has sort of been torpedoed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, sorry. So, if, so if you guys Google USGS. Uh, landslide or mudslide, you'll get this this map I just that showed. And and um, it used to be say say ten years ago when somebody had a map, you're like, what the hell is this? Where is this map? Increasingly, there's a tool that we all use, the company that makes this mapping software, and they increasingly made it easy. Google Earth is one example, but but easy to visualize stuff. All of these folks, if you guys Google flood risk uh, or, or, or mudslide risk or whatever, US, I would Google USGS and, and flood map or, or, or Thomas fire or whatever, and with a couple of clicks, you'll find it. And, and there'll be a, a web page with a map viewer that you can navigate. Not, not a static picture, in other words, but something that's actually in, in, in real space. And you can, you can scroll around and look where your home is or look where your business is. And you can say, hey, am I red, am I yellow, am I orange? Um, agree. Okay, well, so, so I would say that, um, that it's, it's, it's a couple things. It's, it's disaster fatigue. So people have been out of their home for 10 days and they're, they're living with a hotel or friends or whatever that, like, oh God. And then they come back and, and, and the signal is fire, 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 fire. And they're like, rains? Oh man, it's okay. It's the same exact thing as with folks in Katrina. It's the same exact thing as with folks when we have a volcanic eruption. And, and so it's, it's hard to internalize that there's some real risk. And so the, one of the challenges is, again, in this globally weirded world we're going into, you cannot trust your memory. Just because you went through a bunch of rainstorm events and your house didn't flood, or your business didn't flood or whatever, and you're like, it's all good, you need to be really circumspect and ask if that really the case. And I don't want to be snippier here or, 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 or snooty or professor or whatever, but, but really the past is not necessarily a good guy. So the fact that we had a little bit of rain and our house didn't flood or our boat didn't capsize or whatever it was, that's, historically that's how it's worked, right? You're like, oh my God, what do I plan? Oh, I plan on mid-spring mid because that's the time the frost goes away. Things are changing so rapidly that even though that maybe made sense or your interpretation of is this a dangerous place or not made sense 10 years ago, things truly are changing and it's, it's, it's hard to know. So my only caution is, is to be careful with your old assumptions. And the best thing, to be completely honest, to have you guys safe and your family safe, double, you know, re-question all your, your, your thinking that all oh, this is safe. Am I safe? Let me re-look at this. And, and we see this not just with risk from storms, public policy, laws, you'll hear it all the time. Um, I mean, the classic one was, that I talked to my students about is, is in Louisiana, or excuse me, with, with the Deepwater Horizon, these good old boys would say, who, one of them is now Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana, so I'm sorry, said, you know, well, we're not stupid. We know what happens when you mix oil and water. We're not, we're not stupid. We know the water separates. They were stupid. Because water and oil did not behave that way in the deep water horizon. The oil sunk. 
the bottom of the ocean. So I don't, I don't say that, I don't say to mock our my friends in Louisiana, but to say that that in this crazy world we're in, we have to always double check our assumptions and make sure that this thing that we think is going to happen is actually going to happen. Hi, are you here? So you need to get a geological engineer. So this has become a problem. So 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 there used to be tons. The big change was Lock and Sheena. In 2005, Lock and Sheena happened, and 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 the the hillside came down and whatever. That was a huge problem. I purchased our house. We moved down from Stanford right then, and and we could not find a. We could not find a geological engineer. So it took a long time. A lot of those a lot of those engineering firms have stopped servicing homeowners and have instead done like large scale developments or shopping malls. Yeah, they serve the right. Well, so no, there are some. So my point is, um, you need to have one of those guys, uh, one of those folks come in, and, and they they're they're good. They totally know the So we need to have them come do an assessment. And they will tell you, what, you know. So, for example, in my house, it's all solid rock, basically. So, regardless of if my retaining wall falls, or not good the retaining wall falls, but it's it's not with a bunch of rain, my hillside is not going to move. Uh, my neighbor or a couple people down the street, uh, if it rains on their place, it actually might mobilize. So, you, the only way to know is to have a real certified engineer check. And my experience is most of these folks are, are super civic minded. And if you call them and you say, hey, look, I need to know right now, they usually will respond. They might say, wait, I can't write you an official report for another two months, but a lot of times they'll be able to come out and do and do a quick assessment. And say, I know before I know I do that. Exactly. 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 So so um, I would look up geological engineer. Or, 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 or hillside, hillside engineer, by the way, but, 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 but geological engineering firm. I would look those guys up. And I believe county, the county planning division can, can help you, can help point you into some reputable, reputable firms if you don't find anything off on the top of those. So geological, uh, geological consultant firm, geoengineering firm. Okay, most patient woman in the house, right here. Okay, hello. Um, I have a critter concern. Yeah. Um, so I'm in River Park in Oxnard, and usually seeing hawks is kind of a, an occasional treat, but after the fires, I'm seeing more of them come in to the more urbanized areas. But, as you probably know, there's a lot of those poison boxes all over, everywhere, shopping malls, um, neighborhoods that are going up, and, and that. And actually, I have found uh, perfectly intact dead rodents in my neighborhood. Um, I'm wondering who should receive a nasty email to try to get those things eliminated and protect our predators, uh, our, our birds of prey. And as you probably know, the mountain lions also suffer down in San Monica and all the rat poison. It's in outside. It's not protecting the inside of a building. It is poisoning the outside. So, so this is a question about so-called second, genera second generation rodenticides. We have this first generation that you guys might know as warfarin or, or these other rat poisons. And they were really good at killing the rats for the first year or whatever. And they essentially worked by making the rats bleed to death. Uh, and then the rats evolved, they're like, damn, this tastes good, I'm gonna eat this. And so they, they, they developed resistance to this, to this uh, poison that made them bleed to death. So the New Zealanders actually invented this, and this was invented 
attempted by restoration ecologists uh, for islands to deal with rats, non-native rats, Norway rats, exotic species on islands, that they could drop these, these bait stations and kill all the bad rodents and then reintroduce the natives. So, so that all the stuff that you can buy, now, the most effective stuff you can buy now at Home Depot and everything, were created by conservation. This is very good. Just be careful what you wish for. So, so that's what, that's the, that's the challenge we have now. The county is not supposed to use these, use these poisons on, 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 on you know, county land, on, on, on county parks, etc. They are still legal. In, in you know Lowe's and Home Depot and whatever people can buy those and they can't use them. And they are they are fairly effective. The problem is for folks who don't know is, is they, they they kill the they kill the target critter, but they're so good the, the poison is so good that it doesn't just kill the target critter. Then when the scavenger or the predator comes and eats that guy, they themselves can be poisoned. Lots of examples where we've cut open, cut open coyotes and things in our roadkill surveys, and essentially they almost, it's kind of like a science fiction thing, they almost don't have any guts. Their, their internal organs have basically liquefied. So the reference to the, the reference to the, the mountain lions and bobcat, we see it, it was presented as a secondary effect. They have to develop this mange. So we've seen a fair number of these coyotes, but particularly the feline, the cats, the bobcats, and the it looks really sick. So it's obviously a mountain lion, but it's you know, scrubby hair, and it's, and it's you know, hair falling out and skanky. And what's going on is it's, it's so, its immune system is so compromised that these simple little little hair mites, these little little critters on its hair follicles that normally you know, a little itch or scratch or something, not a big deal, actually attack the fur and the skin and develop mange. So, so from a, a visual standpoint from far away, you can recognize mange 99% sure if you see that in a large mammal here in Ventura County, that's most likely caused by that animal ingesting either directly or, or, or indirectly the secondary or the other side. So what should you do about it? So the answer is um, it's very hard because anybody can legally buy it. Not anymore though, they've cut back on some of that. They have, but yeah. you can still mail order it and, and, and trust me. You can. So, so the idea was it's very powerful. Originally, it was the, the certified exterminators that had training. They were the ones that were supposed to use it. And then about 15 years ago, the, the, the manufacturers of these chemicals said, no, 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 everybody should have access to this very powerful poison. And then it got into the, the you know, not needing a prescription, not needing a, a special, special need use, or don't have to do any special training. So that's where the problem really came when it became ubiquitous. So there's been several efforts to to have the stuff made, you know, again, make it legal or at least at least general public it, it can't get it. And that's that's we're sort of in this transition period. So what I would do is I would um, if it's an individual homeowner, you're kind of screwed. You'd be talking to her. Um, we've been doing a project for several years and unfortunately the 2013 fire screwed us. So we established four owl boxes across our campus. And we were in you know, a long-term study where we were looking at owl pellets. So barn owls are notorious for barn owls, like something like hogs will eat food and, and, and whatever. Uh, great horned owls will eat food. Barn owls in particular can eat twice what they need a day. So they eat more than what they need to meet their caloric intake. And so barn owls in particular are, are, are frequent target for, for response to this. The notion is you put up a, a barn owl nest, and that guy is going to not just eat a, a mouse or a rat, but he's going to eat more than he or she needs. So the notion is if we can have these guys, if we can put more roosts up and have more have more owls up there, dude, then we don't need to put as much poison in crap out. So we were we were trying to build a large data set that we could argue more generally that people should do that, but unfortunately the 2013 fire came and basically burned up most of our owls. So our owls are slowly starting to come back, but even now, so many years after 2013, they're not back to the numbers they were before. So we've been we've been hampered by the fire. We we're trying to build this strong argument for, for folks. Um, nevertheless, there's still a lot of folks that have tried barn owls for for rodent suppression. There's some vineyards that are doing it. There's different people. 
So my suggestion would be to talk to the landowners and say, hey, what if we put up a couple barn out nest boxes? The only hitch, and I know we probably have to go, but the only hitch is uh, uh, you put up a barn owl nest box, which is a, a wooden thing. It costs maybe 100 bucks, 200 bucks. You can build it yourself for 50 bucks. But you can get one of these nice ones um, that, that are really uh, 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 supportive of, of owl nesting. The challenge is that to combat, let's say, let's say the home, let's say the developer is to put in his poison because he wants to get wrapped away. We don't just want to put up a box and go, hope we got a good phone room. Like we want to get that barn out there right now, right? You know, like, come on. Because that, that's, what the, that's what the guy that owns the development is like, dude, I, I need to suppress, I have, I have requirements from, from, from human health and it's the inspector that I got to get this rat out of here. So one possibility is the Ohio Raptor Center. Um, they, those guys have you know, injured raptors, they have injured barn out from the, from the Thomas fire. Uh, the notion is you can so called pack a barn owl into one of these nests. When you basically take the barn owl, the chick, let's say, put him or her in the box, and then cover up the hole for a day or two days. And essentially let, let him or her get you know, this is my home. Kind of thing. And then you take the, 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 the seal off, and they go do their do. The challenge is the Raptor, the Ojai Raptor Center has been, dude, if you're using uh, second generation or genocide, we don't want our raptors there. So it's sort of a, an interesting dance. Like we kind of, somebody has to, you know, yeah, I don't want this guy dying from poison, but at the same time, this guy can help us get off of poison. Right? So it's, I don't have the answer, but there's, that's the landscape. You, you could propose barn. The eradicators, I believe they've made them so much better, they're so much more effective, and it's not poison, so it would be worth looking into that. I think we really need to wrap this up now, guys.